has come from Russia, and he will give a uh, lecture on Russia in the in the Pacific region challenges and opportunities. We have also uh, with us Dr. Mohammad Munir Zaman, Professor of Global Studies and member of Center for Peace Studies of South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, North South University, who will be the discussant here. Uh, before uh, uh, going to the actual session, uh, as I said that the modality will be seen, this is a, a lecture series. So our speaker will be talking about how long you want to yeah, so maybe 20 to 25 minutes, you will be speaking at first. And then we will listen from our designated discussion for Professor Nur Zaman for 10 minutes. And then the, uh, there will be open session, question and answer. And we want to see that our faculty members and the students, they interact uh, with our uh, uh, designated discussant and also the speaker here. So we want to give more time for the question and answer session. I'm sure that you have many questions in your mind. Okay, so before going to uh, the topic itself, a little bit introduction, I just uh, tell you about SIPG. South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance is a uh, prime research institute in North South University. We do lots of this uh, regional studies kind of uh, activity. We have uh, graduate programs too. Uh, one is our regular master's in public policy and governance, and also we have an executive master in policy and governance. Apart from the uh, teaching programs and the master's program, SAPG also uh, has two centers. One is Center for Peace Studies, and the other one is Center for Migration Studies. And um, we do lots of research on uh, peace, uh, conflict, uh, migration, uh, geopolitics, public policy, governance, uh, regionally. So it's a, basically a South Asian institute and we have lots of student exchange with South Asian countries. We get students from Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and also other Southeast Asian countries. And also we do joint research with the South Asian universities and uh, education institutes. SIPG is a very research active institute. We do publish lots of uh, uh, books, journal articles, and other kind of the publication the documents. It has uh, two journals. Uh, one is North South Journal of uh, Global Studies, Peace and Global Studies. Other is South Asian Journal of uh, Policy and Governance. So with that note, I will not take much more time. Well, you know today's topic, uh, the Russia in the Indo-Pacific region, challenges and opportunities. And this is the, uh, this month, uh, this not this month, in the last uh, two months, this is the second uh, 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 <clears throat> seminar that we are organizing in this topic. So as I was saying that uh, SIPG regularly organizing this thing because uh, Indo-Pacific is so important for Bangladesh and the region. We organized uh, another seminar on Bangladesh's approach towards emerging alliance in Asia. On, uh, in February 2023. And as a follow up of the, uh, the seminar that we are doing, we are also will have another uh, seminar in this week uh, about Indo Pacific that uh, how Bangladesh, Japan, India trilateral partnership uh, will uh, create some new uh, horizon of uh, developmental activities in this region on Wednesday this uh, week. So let me give a brief introduction about our. Today's uh, uh, lecture, Alexei Kuprianov. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alexei Kuprianov uh, is a senior research fellow and head of the Center for the Indo Pacific Region of uh, IMEMORAS. He was born in um, July 12, 1979, in Moscow. Mr. Kuprianov studied the Anglo Saxon history at the Department of History of the Moscow City Teacher Training University and English language and literature in Ireland. He has a master's degree in IR, international relation, after graduating from the Diplomatic Academy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia. He worked as a foreign affairs journalist on TV and in various newspapers. His research interests cover history and modernity of the countries of South, Southeast and East Asia, Indian external policy, Indo-Pacific region, Indo-Chinese relations, colonialism, post-colonialism, and new colonialism, the theory of sovereignty, theory, and history of the international relations. So we are so happy that uh, we have him here physically. 
So without further delay, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Alexi to give his speech. Oh, no, it's a bit here. Dear friends, uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be with you here. So uh, I work on the Indian Ocean region in IMMO. It's Institute of World Economy and International Relations in Moscow under the Russian Academy of Science. So our institute was founded back uh, in 1925, then ceased to exist in 1947. It was merged with the Institute of Economy of Russian Academy of Soviet Academy of Science, and then was recreated nine years later. So we deal uh, with contemporary issues, uh, primarily economics, politics, but as a historian, I believe that in order to talk about the present, well, it's the best beginning to, well, to begin from the past. So uh, it's necessary to know history, and so I'll start with history. Uh, so the history of Russian presence in the Indian Ocean region began more than a uh, thousand years ago, in fact, because its first this presence was indirect because Russia served as transit space uh, through which uh, there was trade between Scandinavia and the Indian Ocean region. And the goods were delivered along the river system from the Baltic Sea to the Volga. And uh, from there, they were transported across the Caspian Sea to Persia, so Iran, and then to India. And gradually, Russian merchants began to appear for goods. And uh, the first Russian merchant known to us was Afanasy Nikitin uh, from the Tver city, who visited India in uh, 15th century, uh, in 1468. And so he left very interesting notes about his journey and following him, other Russian merchants and travelers began to appear in India. Uh, but Russia as a state did not take part uh, in uh, European colonial expansion because, uh, well, just when the Portuguese appeared in India, Russia was fighting against the descendant of uh, Genghis Khan empire, the Golden Horde, the Khazan Khanet, the Astrakhan Khanet, and uh, then gradually seized the former territories of Genghis Khan empire. Uh, and when the British East India Company appeared in India, Russia was going through the time of troubles and fought for its independence against Poland. And uh, so the first Russian emperor, the first Russian Tsar, who uh, became interested in the Indian Ocean region, uh, ironically was the Peter the Great. Uh, so during the Northern War, he learned then Charles, uh, Charles XII, the King of Sweden, uh, so wanted to make an alliance with the uh, pirate king of Madagascar and decided to send his expedition to Madagascar in order to get ahead of Charles and make an alliance with the king of Madagascar first. And uh, however, the ships were needed in the Baltic Sea to fight the Swedish fleet and uh, so the expedition did not place and I think it was for the best because, well, in fact, uh, really was no pirate kingdom on Madagascar at that time. So after that, Russia was mainly occupied with the wars with land neighbors and uh, did not develop the Navy. And when it again built a large fleet, large Navy, uh, so it was already the 19th century and uh, all territories around the Indian Ocean were colonized or no, vassalized. And uh, so something happened that Russia turned to be one of few great European powers that uh, so did not have colonies in the Indian Ocean region. And uh, this turned out to be very unfortunate when the war with Japan in uh, 1904 began because the Russian squadron uh, had to go around all the Africa and across the Indian Ocean and didn't have bases along the way to repair. And uh, it's also one of the reasons why the Russian fleet, the Russian squadron, was defeated in the Battle of Tsushima. Uh, however, Russian ships were present in the region and some even sunk here. So in uh, 1861, during the storm in the Indian Ocean, the Russian clipper Oprichnik uh, went missing with all hands. And during the World War I, the German cruiser Emden entered the port of Penang and sunk Russian cruiser Jemshuk there. So it is a memorial of uh, the lost of uh, dedicated to the memory of the Jemshuk sailors. Uh, but the full scale presence of, presence of Russia in the Indian Ocean region began only after the Second World War. Uh, the Soviet Union came out as, oh, from the World War as one of great powers, one of superpowers. And uh, in order to maintain the status of superpower, it was necessary to build a large fleet. So the idea of building this fleet was developed by Admiral Sergei Goshkov. So uh, sometimes he is called the Russian Mechan, 
uh, but unlike Mechan, he advocated uh, not only destruction of the enemy's navy in a pitched battle because Gorkov lived in the days of Cold War and days of nuclear weapons and understood that it would not work to destroy the enemy fleet in this situation. So he developed the concept of maximizing naval efforts, so both military and civilian. Uh, and uh, so warships constantly kept, his warships also constantly kept the United States in a state of tension. Uh, but the civilian, uh, the uh, marine uh, fleet at the same time helped the military by exploring the world ocean and extracting resources from them. And Sergei Gorkov was also a big supporter of developing cooperation with South Asia, uh, Asian countries, especially with India, and USSR actively helped India uh, so to build a fleet before the war of 1971. And when the United States sent a group of aircraft carrier enterprise into Bay of Bengal, so the Soviet command ordered the deployment of submarines here, informing the Indians they could not be afraid of Americans. And so it was the Indian missile boat with crews and captains trained in the Soviet Union and built in Russia and launched the famous military attack on the Karachi port in uh, 1971. So after the victory in the war, the Soviet fleet was constantly present in the region and based on the ports of Masawa, Berbera, Aden, and Socotra Islands, uh, Soviet ships provided assistance to friendly states in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, they go, uh, guarded merchant ships and created mines uh, So in Iran-Iraq war. And they also opposed the Americans, but the Indian Ocean for the Soviet Union and the United States was uh, important, of course, but secondary sector of the Cold War, and here the Soviet-American squadrons, uh, they, of course, opposed each other, but at the same time, they solved uh, common problems, ensuring the safety of sea lines and fishing fleets. And after the collapse of Soviet Union, Russia withdrew from the Indian Ocean region. In fact, it was an economic crisis, so, uh, and uh, its formidable navy was dying in its basis, and Russia was not in the mood to support its allies in remote regions. And the gradual return of Russia uh, to the region began only in the beginning of 21st century, when Russian ships began to appear there more, more and more often and conduct joint exercises with the uh, states of the region, especially with India and Iran. And in uh, 2012, oh, 2012, I'm sorry, uh, the war in Syria began, and Russia acquired by bases in Mediterranean, uh, Latakia, and Tartus. Uh, and uh, through, uh, through the, which, uh, this basis, uh, so-called Syrian Express. Now, basis, it's a route for delivery of ammunition and equipment to the fight in Syria and Russian troops in Syria. And uh, to secure this basis from the south, Russia has begun negotiations with Sudan to establish a naval base. Uh, in the Red Sea at Flamingo Bay, and uh, so these negotiations were successful, but the long-term political crisis in Sudan put these uh, plans in jeopardy, but uh, most likely, even if the deal with Sudan fails, the Russian base will still appear there, perhaps maybe not in Sudan, but in Eritrea and maybe in Mozambique. Uh, so the second important factor was the beginning of the crisis in Ukraine, uh, because Russia uh, is cut off from Western markets, investments, uh, Western technologies, and it has no choice but to turn east, including to Iran and India. And Russian trade with these countries is growing. Now it's Russian trade with India is about $40 billion. It's a great jump, a four-time jump from the last year when it was about $11 billion. Uh, so, and trade routes pass through the Western Indian Ocean and Suez Channel, and uh, as well as through Eastern Indian Ocean and through the Strait of Malacca. And these routes must be protected. At, uh, so, we had some very unpleasant episodes. Uh, so, immediately after the start, the start of our military operation in Ukraine, when Russian merchant ships were detained and even captured uh, by European warships in the North Sea. And so Russia will have to deploy its military presence in the region to protect its ship in, in dangerous points. Uh, so it's, since it's, this is critical to functioning of Russian economy, it's clear that this process will continue no matter how the operation in Ukraine goes. And so now for Russia, there is a main task in the ocean region, so this protects us of slugs, well, from both potentially hostile ships and from pirates. 
So it requires the presence of Russian squadrons, both in the western and eastern parts of the ocean. Uh, so uh, it means that we need a basis for these squadrons. And if everything is quite simple in the western part, in eastern part, it's not yet clear where these bases can be. Uh, a big plus is that uh, all regional powers are quite positive or neutral about the possible presence of Russia, viewing it's an independent force that had no other interest in the region than to ensure the security of its trade there. Uh, this is true because Russia and the Western sections is primarily, I am sorry that I focused on this point because it's quite important for us. It's primarily interested in supporting its economy. And so we need to reorient the flow, the big flow of gas, big flow of fertilizers, big flow of oil and grain that goes now to West, went to the West until the last end. So to another direction, to the East and ensure it's a hindering passage. And uh, so Russia is absolutely interested in acting as stabilizing forces that doesn't cherish anyone's rights and does not enroach on anyone's interests. So in addition, of course, we have other interests here because so we're interested in scientific research because uh, so in the Pacific warm pool, you know, warms up the atmosphere and we want to understand how global warming is happening. So what risk and what benefits it brings to us. And uh, every year our research ships appear in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so we have special institute uh, that is focused on the researchers in uh, high seas. It's uh, uh, Institute of Oceanography in Moscow. So, and uh, so it, in fact, uh, so it runs all the ships and all these expeditions. And we have a special scientific base in Vietnam now under, uh, from the Soviet times. Uh, so uh, we want our fishing fleet to return here because, uh, well, in conditions when we are cut off from supplies of fish from Norway and Japan, we need to extract it ourselves as actively as possible in high seas. And finally, we are interested uh, in developing bilateral cooperation with the countries of the region because trade with China, India, Iran is good, but uh, the more industrialized the countries here are, the larger the range of trade will be and the wider our trade base will be, the more stable our economy will be here. So trade, trade and one trade with the countries of Indian Ocean region is implementation of joint projects in energy, uh, other high tech areas, scientific research, joint naval exercise and interaction to ensure the slogs. So there's a motto of Russia in coming decades. And uh, Russia has no enemies in region. It's well, our big benefit. And we are interested in mutually beneficial cooperation with all local players, including the Bangladesh, including Bangladesh, especially since the attitude towards Bangladesh and Russia in, to, towards Bengali people in Russia is very good because we have not forgotten the 1971. Uh, so uh, I told mainly about Indian Ocean region. Well, because, well, I'm, in fact, I'm official representative for Russia in academic group of IRA. But uh, that's partly because we have quite ambiguous view on Indo-Pacific, not on Indian Ocean, but on Indo-Pacific, because, well, uh, so in our official narrative uh, that it was by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, well, it, do it doesn't like Indo-Pacific, because uh, in this narrative, Indo-Pacific is perceived as a project that was uh, invented by the United States in opposition to China, uh, in opposition to Asia-Pacific, in order to exclude China from the region and possibly exclude Russia from the regional order. In fact, in Russia, there is more than, uh, well, we have one more point of view. So we have a uh, very lively discussion about that, a very vivid discussion. So among scholars, among experts, among officials, and uh, some support, uh, we have a group of people who support official point of view. And uh, so a lot of people that believe that Russia needs to develop its own vision of the Pacific. And this vision should be inclusive and include all powers here, including China. China, Iran, and now the countries that the uh, United States are trying to exclude from the Pacific order. Well, but unfortunately, the, all these debates uh, so are conducted within a very little circle of people in Russia because geopolitically, Russia, for Russia, it doesn't matter what the name of contract is, Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, because we have just one entry point into the region, it's the port of Vladivostok. But, well, now uh, Far East, uh, so we have not only Far East, but now negotiations about base in Red East, so Russia may have another entry point, point in the region. So, and maybe this issue would make sense to reconsider. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alexi, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, if I can uh, summarize very briefly that uh, uh, with a very short period of the time, he, he made it a kind of a projected uh, history of maritime uh, uh, industry and also maritime activities of Russia. And as he was arguing that uh, Russia was not uh, part of the European colonialism. So the maritime history of uh, many of the European countries and Russia are probably in, a, in that sense a little bit uh, different. And then uh, there, is, uh, there are developments uh, during the Soviet era when uh, uh, there was, a, as a superpower, Soviet Union also had a, a huge presence in the maritime uh, boundaries uh, globally. And uh, one of the examples that you are citing uh, that uh, the presence of uh, Russian fleet uh, uh, during our uh, liberation war and how it played a role, uh, a decis decisive role uh, for uh, the involvement of uh, Western powers against uh, uh, India and Russia in, in that war. So, and then uh, he came to the uh, discussion about the uh, fall of Soviet Union and uh, Russia withdraw most of the cases, most of the oceans, then especially Indian Ocean after the collapse of Soviet Union. And then the situation evolved uh, gradually. And after this, uh, the conflict and war has started with uh, Ukraine, uh, the access to sea and the seaports have uh, become a, probably another important uh, factor for Russia as a nation because uh, they are now facing sanctions. Their ships are not being allowed to uh, uh, get anchored in many of the ports and the trades and businesses have been affected. So uh, Russia's uh, position is now, that's why about maritime is getting more important. And as far as I do understand that uh, uh, since Russia's relation with uh, Europe has uh, been deteriorated uh, recent times, for Russia is more looking into the East rather than the West uh, for more business and trade and other things. And he was, uh, showing some data that uh, how the Russia's business with India and Iran and China have been <clears throat> manifold uh, increased in last uh, one and a half year. So these are the major things that uh, he was uh, uh, trying to uh, explain to us and which are very important to understand the Russian's perspective of uh, the current uh, economic order and how, how Russia sees to uh, uh, or Russia perceives to uh, see the future economic uh, uh, trade routes, uh, especially the maritime routes to be in place in coming days. So with that, uh, just um, um, my, my summarization, I would now re request Professor Nur Zaman uh, to give uh, his comments on the presentation. If I just give a introduction of Professor Nur Zaman, he's a professor of political science and also member of Center for Peace Studies at North South University. Professor Nur Zaman is serving as managing editor of two academic journals, current research journal of social sciences and humanities, and North South Journal of Peace and Global Studies. Dr. Nur Zaman specializes in international relations theory, global political economy, human rights and human security, great powers in the global order, political Islam, and politics and international relations of the Middle East and South Asia. His major publications have appeared in leading peer-reviewed international journals, including Canadian Journal of Political Science, International Journal, Canada's Journal of Global Policy Analysis, International Studies Perspective, Cooperation and Conflict, International Area Studies Review, Journal of Contemporary Asia, Global Studies, and many others. So over to you, Professor Nur Zaman. You'll get 10 minutes time. Can I use this? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alexi, uh, my distinguished colleagues, students, uh, all of you are welcome. And um, I am going to make some brief comments on what Dr. Uh, Alexi has uh, already said. Uh, to begin with, um, he has mentioned the historical background of the former Soviet Union and the present day Russia in terms of uh, its involvement in the Indian Ocean region. And particularly, he mentioned the 1971 War of Independence of Bangladesh. We are grateful to the former Soviets and present the Russians 
because they did everything possible to support the war of independence. And it, in fact, it was the Soviet Union that vetoed twice to support the war of independence of the Bengalis, now uh, proud of this uh, independent uh, Bangladesh. Without uh, Soviet vetoes, I think the independent idea, a statehood of Bangladesh uh, could actually die down at that time because that both resolutions are actually brought to the UN Security Council by the United States of America. Not only that, it also sent the seventh fleet naval ships to the Bay of Bengal in support of Pakistan. And as Dr. Alexei has mentioned, the Soviet Union also sent two to three uh, submarines uh, to the Bay of Bengal as well. In any case, uh, that's a, a, a historical fact, and uh, we still uh, remain uh, very much indebted uh, to the uh, Russians uh, for that particular help. Now, while uh, making his presentation, Dr. Alexei has also highlighted the gradual involvement of the former Soviet Union and also the present day uh, Russian Federation uh, in the affairs of the Indian Ocean uh, region. And now let me uh, make it clear that even today, China and Russia, they do not accept the American concept of Indo-Pacific uh, region. They are the say Asia-Pacific uh, region. So the Indo-Pacific region is now currently in currency Primarily, it was coined to please the Indians, I think. Uh, in any case, uh, a reason can go by the name Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific. Uh, that, that might be, of course, uh, geopolitically important. That might carry uh, significance uh, as well. Now, in order to understand the Russian involvement, let me tell you that even today, Russia does not have any well-developed Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, it has developed some perspectives. It was also clear from Dr. Alexei's uh, speech. Uh, and they do not have really any official uh, uh, strategy uh, till today. Even China, it is now trying to come up with uh, alternative uh, strategies to resist the American pressure. Now, by Indo-Pacific strategy, we actually refer to both uh, the quadly lateral uh, military uh, dialogue and then the uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework. So the Indo-Pacific economic framework has been lately developed by the United States of America. It is not really uh, concrete uh, as well. Now there are uh, divergent reactions uh, to the particular IPS, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Um, uh, let me make it uh, clear to you that uh, because Russia was not really extensively involved uh, in this particular Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, historically, it was, but not really to a large scale or to a large extent. So uh, from that viewpoint, uh, still Russia has some uh, specific interest. Like it has its own Eurasian Economic Union involving the Central Asian Republics and from the Caucasus, primarily Armenia. So these states together make up the Eurasian Economic uh, Union. And all these states are landlocked states. So only Russia has access uh, to the Pacific, not even to the Indian Ocean. So the economic integrity, integration, the external trade of all these states hugely depend on access to the sea routes. So only Russia can provide all its uh, Eurasian economic partners with access to the uh, Pacific uh, Ocean. So that was the uh, number one reason why Russia is now concerned. But Russia is more concerned actually after the uh, military uh, operation in uh, Ukraine. What uh, Russian president said is a special military operation. Other people say it's actually a war, uh, Russian war on Ukraine. In any case, uh, before, um, before this uh, uh, special military operation in Ukraine, Russia actually was concerned with non-military issues. Uh, what I have already mentioned, the access of the Eurasian Economic Union members to the uh, Indian Ocean and also to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, secondly, Russia was also very much concerned about the eastward expansion of NATO, uh, meaning that coming close to the next door uh, neighbor of uh, Russian Federation. And uh, that particular factor is uh, forcing the uh, Russians to view the Quad, the Quad consisting of India, 
Australia, Japan, and the United States as an extension uh, of Asian NATO, uh, uh, extension of European NATO to Asian uh, Indo Pacific uh, region. So it is called the Asian NATO by the Russians, but it is primarily, uh, I think, uh, at the academic level. Uh, may, it may not exist at the official level, but academics are talking about discussing this uh, particular uh, probability of creating an Asian NATO uh, in the Indo-Pacific, just to maintain America's uh, centrality uh, in this uh, particular part of the world, number one, and second, to contain the rise of China, because China is now a giant economic power. It is now challenging America uh, in international trade, investments, uh, technology, uh, et cetera. So the competition is there, and the purpose is to uh, contain uh, China. But uh, the United States actually did not make much progress with regard to the IPS, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, the reasons are that most members feel uneasy, uh, uneasy with this uh, particular idea. So for example, India, Australia, Japan, the three members alongside the United States of the Quad. Now, Australia itself is the number one trading uh, trading partner of uh, China. And Australia depends on China for 39% of its uh, export trade and 29% of its uh, import uh, trade. So it is very difficult for Australia to choose a site going directly against uh, India. The same is true of Japan. Japan has extensive economic, commercial, financial links uh, to Beijing. And in any case, the Japanese prefer to maintain some kind of a containment and hedging strategy, meaning that they participate in the court. At the same time, they are not cutting off their trade relations, economic relations with uh, China. So that's why the Japanese prefer some kind of a uh, very cautious uh, approach uh, towards China. And for India, it's a big dilemma for different reasons. Number one reason is that India has been traditionally a non-aligned country, and it emphasizes independent foreign policy posture, meaning that it is not really ready to compromise its foreign policy independence, being a part of the Quad, being a part of the IPS. So the Indians are unlikely uh, to follow the American leadership role all the time, uh, unquestionably. Uh, the second reason is that India is also a very prominent member of the BRICS, consisting of Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, China, sorry, uh, uh, India, China, and South Africa. So these countries. And the primary purpose of the BRICS is to curb American dominance, American unilateralism in the world. So Russia, India uh, aligns itself with the US. At the same time, it is against the US because it's a uh, primary purpose of BRICS, how, how India actually subscribes to a large extent, is to uh, control American global uh, dominance. And all the countries, despite their differences, are working uh, towards that uh, particular purpose. And the third important reason is that uh, traditionally India and the Russian Federation, the former Soviet Union, were very close strategic partners. They came to each other's support on different international issues. Even today, India has some kind of a 75 year of a strategic partnership with Russia. Now the question is, which side India can actually choose? Is it uh, Russia, China on the one side, or it, uh, is it the United States of America? So we know that uh, India has multiple territorial conflicts and other conflicts with, the, uh, with China, but at the same time, uh, it is also a member of the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And you would know that uh, uh, India is going to be the chairperson of the uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization in September 2023. And also it will, be, it will take over the chairmanship of the G20 uh, in November 2023. And, uh, and President Putin can, of course, uh, uh, expect uh, India to play a more constructive role, at least not to allow G20 and SCO to go against uh, the Russian uh, Federation. So it's because of their long continued 
strategic uh, cooperation, strategic partnership between the countries. So that's why I believe that uh, the IPS, the uh, Indo, uh, Indo Pacific strategy, uh, is not really that much uh, viable. It is now making some kind of a rhetorical position. It is coming to the press. It is uh, becoming a part of the foreign policy decision making process of many countries. But after a few years, I think this idea will be actually non existent. Uh, it's not going to work uh, in the way the United States uh, would actually expect uh, because of divergent interest, uh, because of uh, crisscross uh, 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 networks uh, between the Asian powers. So the only country that has followed the United States actually is Singapore. It has imposed sanctions on the Russian Federation following the outbreak of the war. Uh, other than that, I think uh, Russia maintains excellent relations with three Asian countries, India, China, and Vietnam. So these three countries uh, never actually supported the American position at the UN Security Council. Uh, they mostly abstained uh, from UN Security Council uh, votes uh, concerning the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, or what you may also call the US-Russia war in Ukraine, uh, because America is the number one party. It, it draws up a plan of the war. It provides uh, 80 to 90% of the total uh, war budgets uh, for Ukraine. So in that case, uh, I believe that it's really a war between the US and the Russian Federation being fought in Ukraine. So the battleground is Ukraine. It's not really uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war. In any case, uh, let me come down to the last few points after the, uh, after the war broke out. What happened? So Russia actually became more concerned that uh, traditionally Europe provided it the largest markets for its uh, oil, gas uh, exports. But uh, almost 50% of Russian oil and gas exported to the European markets. After the war, it has just come down to 35%. And uh, what Russia needs now, it needs uh, to capture Asian markets. So that's why it provided India with uh, huge quantities of oil at highly discounted uh, price. So India just uh, imported 1% of its total oil imports before the war broke out. But now that has jumped to 22%. Uh, by the end of 2022. So 22% of total Indian oil exports uh, from the Russian uh, Federation. And the same is true of China. China is also buying uh, huge quantities of uh, Russian oil and gas, but unfortunately there is no oil, uh, sorry, there is no gas uh, transmission pipelines uh, between uh, China and the, uh, and the Russian Federation. They're trying to construct uh, from Siberia, Siberia to uh, to, uh, to China. Uh, you have just one, yes, uh, from uh, connecting the two countries, but uh, th there is also proposal to construct one from Siberia to uh, China that is not actually uh, taking off the ground. So uh, in any case, the, in, uh, the two other uh, countries affected by the Zanzam, war- Two minutes. Okay, uh, affected by the war are actually South Korea and uh, North Korea. Uh, North Korea has, uh, it, it is alleged that North Korea is uh, exporting, providing Russia with arms and ammunition. And also there are reports in the air that some 100,000 North, Korea, North Korean troops might go to Ukraine to fight for Russia. I say these are reports in the air, there is no really authenticity. But uh, uh, it indicates that North Korea has actually moved much closer to the Russian Federation as has uh, Iran. Uh, probably that, uh, and then uh, China was also uh, thought of providing uh, Russia, uh, uh, the uh, Russian Federation with arms and ammunition. The Chinese really uh, denied that, but still it is actually uh, debatable that uh, the China provided uh, the Russian Federation with arms and weapons, ammunition, but of course Russian financial, diplomatic, political support uh, known to everyone. Uh, they actually clearly stand behind the Russian Federation uh, diplomatically, politically, financially, and uh, economically. So, but North Korea has exploited this uh, situation much more than any, any other country because uh, North Korea has expedited its uh, missile uh, technology uh, proliferation and also the test of new nuclear weapons. 
And America is not in a position to stand up to the North Koreans because they are very busy with the war in uh, Ukraine. So they are just simply taking advantage uh, of the situation. Uh, in any case, uh, I think uh, these are the main points I wanted to make here. And thank you, Dr. Alexi, again uh, for coming to uh, North South University. And we hope to see you again uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nur Zaman, for a very comprehensive and uh, diverse comments. And uh, as a discussion, I think our students now can get a uh, full picture that uh, what are we uh, discussing here. I just want to, before uh, opening up the floor, I just want to let all our participants know that, and I can see that a huge number of uh, online participations are there, almost like uh, there were 60 participants there in online, probably. So the online participants, if you want to ask any question to our, uh, our speaker or our discussant, you can write it in the chat box. We will not be able to give you uh, opportunity to give the live comment. And uh, for the students, you can uh, raise your hands. But uh, just uh, before opening the uh, floor, just let uh, everyone know that uh, North South University uh, is very open to all kinds of the discussions. And we would like to see that uh, open critical debates and discussions have been happened within our students so that they can develop a critical mind. And uh, that's why we always try to invite uh, people from different sections and uh, try to understand their perspective because the uh, world is very diversified and there is not only one center in the world, there are multiple centers. So we need to understand all the perspectives uh, which are working in this uh, uh, world order. So with that, uh, just a preliminary note, I would like to open the floor now, uh, maybe from our faculty or the students, whoever want to, okay, from the student side. Please uh, tell your name and also ask the question. Hello, sir. My name is Sripath Hussain. I'm from BBA department. Uh, my question is, uh, what role does Russia see itself playing in the Indo-Pacific region? And how does it plan to pursue its interest in the face of other powers, competing claims and interests? Thank you. So, uh, so it seems to me that I answered this question, your question in my so presentation. I can just add that we are going to expand our trade with the countries, and so we understand that the, we have a problem of sanctions here, because so we had one unpleasant experience with the Ursa Mayor ships. Uh, so when it was prohibited to intro the Bangladesh port with a part of uh, parts with uh, for Rupert nuclear station. So, but we hope that, uh, so we understand that now we see the creation of alternative uh, routes of supplies. Well, alternative supply chains. And uh, so in fact, uh, so we have official, for example, official numbers of trade between Russia and India, Russia and Iran, Russia and Bangladesh. At the same time, in fact, as a part of this trade, uh, so is going in so-called gray zone. So it's a uh, uh, middle level, low level Indian companies, small companies, middle companies are trying to evade American sanctions and uh, so export uh, so goods to Russia through the third countries. It's uh, so a lot of reports about this in press, uh, but it's uh, so it's typical for the uh market economy i think because you are trying to sanction all the straight you are trying to stop you are trying to use the economy as a pressure as a leverage against one country but uh, a free economy uh so it will always uh, find the way for the goods into these countries so we are interested in uh in fact and stabilize all the situation and uh so in uh well, in uh, honest and in uh, poor and uh, in clean uh, trade with uh, all these countries in the region. And we are interested in supporting these countries, the economy of these countries and growing because uh, so uh, for us, the more economy developed these countries will be, so the more valuable trade partners for us they will be. 
And uh, so that's why we support Bangladesh, for example, and uh, we are ready to support any other country around the Indian Ocean region uh, in the development project. And uh, so, so we understand the problems of Bangladesh because Bangladesh is a mainly export-oriented country, especially mainly oriented to European Union. Well, but uh, so it's always choice between the bravery to be uh, so to develop more, and uh, so you're uh, willing to continue this export-oriented model. So India uh, doesn't fear to buy Russian oil, uh, being at the same time uh, so the strategic partner of the United States. And there uh, can uh, defend its position before well in front of the United States. And India, so that's why India is a great country, I think. So I wish, the Bangl I wish Bangladesh to do the same. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Excuse me, can I just add up? Uh, let me first introduce myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yekaterina Semenova. I am Deputy Chief of Mission of the Russian Embassy here. Again, happy to be here. It's our first engagement of this kind with your honorable and very renowned university. So again, glad to be here. And we are excited that we brought managed to bring our expert uh, from Russia who just concluded his participation in the Indian Ocean Conference here uh, in Dhaka. So, and he consented to come here and share his views. That's, that, again, thank you very much, Dr. Alexei. Uh, just to, uh, to the question that was just asked, uh, about our presence and uh, the uh, um, policy of Russia towards this region. Uh, I must say that uh, in 2021, Russia became the dialogue partner for the Indian Ocean Rim Organization. And uh, last year, we took part in the um, uh, uh, ministerial meeting uh, of this organization, and we have a number of projects going on with the Nayora. And it's, we are kind of new. We are not a full-fledged member just because we don't have any uh, physical presence in the Indian Ocean, but very we are looking forward to our um, to sharing experience, to sharing ideas, and again with Bangladesh within its interests within Ayora, we are having certain projects in terms of fisheries, in terms of aquaculture, and this engagement is set to be growing uh, more. So that's just a small add up to what Dr. Alexei just said. Thank you. Uh, so can I make one remark then? Yeah, I'm awfully sorry, I was forgotten. I would like to make one remark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for your presentation. It's about uh, so quote. Yeah, you mentioned quote as action, action nature, so called. So, uh, from my point of view, and from my colleague's point of view, quote is not actually Asian NATO because, well, we have India inside the quote with Indian independent position. And so India stopped to all this process as well inside the quote to become a NATO block, something like NATO block. But we are nervous about the NATO direct expansion in the Indo-Pacific. So, for example, the opening of NATO office in Japan. So the expansion, uh, Japan maritime expansion in our region, because you know that we have a uh, territorial dispute with Japan. So Japan has territorial dispute with us, not we with Japan. So, uh, of course, we are nervous about that. And so we know about uh, frequent visits, visits of uh, European ships into uh, Taiwan Straits and into our, to our borders and uh, so-called uh, free and free and open. Uh, no, no, uh, this operation about free passages uh, on the, the Taiwan Strait. Navigation. Yes, free navigation. Well, uh, of course, so we think that, uh, so we understand that it's uh, something like extension. We see it as uh, maybe preliminary steps to extension of NATO into in the Pacific, and especially the creation of AUKUS. Uh, so AUKUS, well, with Australia, Australia is the center of the British, uh, the United, United Kingdom, United States, as Australia partner there, we see maybe as a, uh, basement for the creation of the Indo-Pacific part of NATO. Thank you. Okay, yeah, person Norman. Uh, I think uh, you can also answer if you find that uh, relevant. Any of you? Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm uh, Norman Swazo, professor of philosophy and director of the Office of Research here at North South University. Uh, if we can set aside for the moment the distinction and conceptual 
issues associated with unipolarity, multipolarity. Uh, I wonder whether, given your presentation and the difficulties associated with whether we're talking about Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, uh, you consider Europe, uh, you consider Russia to be a country in Europe or a country in Asia? Because I think a lot of the problem that we have now in terms of the tensions in Europe have to do with the fact that that historical question and current question has not been properly settled. And if it were settled, much of the tensions that we have in terms of multipolarity, unipolarity would be solved. What's your sense of that? Thank you, sir, for the question. So for us, uh, Russia is not European country, not Asian country, it's Eurasian country. Uh, so because, well, as, uh, well, as a historian, I can say that Europe, Asia is just a construct. It's not, well, real physical reality because you cannot find uh, so difference between Russian police uh, so uh, beyond the Ural mountains and before the Ural mountains, they are the same Russians and the same, well, for example, uh, if you cross this line, well, if you live in Europe, if you cross the line to Asia, you will not become Asian. Well, and the, uh, so for us, the multipolarity is the inevitable future. Because, well, unipolar moment, it's just, and bipolar moments, in fact, it's just a moment. It's unnatural for us because, well, during the old world history, uh, so the situation always led to balance between the countries. And uh, so it's natural for us, and we think that uh, so Russia should be one of the all the poles, well, of this multipolar world. But we in MMO, we do not like the world multipolar. We prefer polycentric because, well, polarity is always polarity. Polarity, you have two poles who oppose each other, and polycentric is more a flexible situation. Well, for example, Turkey, which country is it? Asiatic or European? It has its European part and Asian part. Well, and I, I, I talk with uh, uh, Turkish uh, people who live along the Aegean Sea, well, sea line. And they told me they were oh, all these Asiatic Turks. No, no, they are not real Turks. We are real Turks. So our Turkey is real Turkey yeah, because our Turkey belongs to Europe. If I may just follow up, the, the, the point, of course, is, is not to do with the geography. The, the, we, we have so much imaginary geography when it comes to borders in, in the world as is in international relations and so on. But the question relates, of course, to the geopolitics of the moment. And I think that's the essential question with respect to the way in which policy and strategy are being decided today. So, with, in fact, until the uh, 2008, uh, we behaved and we uh, perceived ourselves as a European, European country because, well, maybe you remember it was a, a President Putin idea about Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok. So, and he tried to uh, incorporate, well, it was, uh, Russia has a long history of trying of incorporation into the European order. Well, uh, I don't know, it's uh, quite a little known fact that after NATO creation, Stalin, uh, it was Stalin idea to incorporate United uh, the Soviet Union into NATO. Of course, he was refused. And uh, so after the collapse of Soviet Union, it was Yeltsin asked to incorporate Russia into European, uh, future, future European Union, into NATO as well. And he was again politely refused because Russia is too big to be incorporated into Europe. Because even European Russia is bigger than uh, so European Union itself in composition. So uh, now geopolitically, we are trying to learn to be uh, more Asiatic than more European. It's not easy because uh, our main population is in European country and our main industry in the European part of our country and our main industry in the European part of country and after Peter the Great. Uh, so it's uh, our way of mind to think of itself as Europeans. But so for us, maybe it's not the problem because uh, so look at the British, for example. Well, uh, 
they on on French. Well, all of them are European, but they have no problem to have business with their Asiatic countries. So uh, nobody of them think about that. Wow, I'm from Europe. Has a moral right to have a business with China, for example. So we, you know, we have to learn the same way, I think. So, Dr. Alex, you say that uh, you are Europeans and you are an integral part of European history, European culture, European civilization. But in fact, the West Europeans do not think that you are Europeans, and at least not equal Europeans. And uh, there is a particular scholar from your own country, Alexander Dugin, and I hope that you are familiar with his thesis. So in a 2017 book, he produced a fatalistic thesis. So, and he classified the European uh, Western states into two categories, island nations or island civilizations and land nations or land civilizations. And uh, Russia is a land civilization and uh, Europeans are actually island civilizations. And these uh, two civilizations always clashed with each other and Russia was always a victim of Western aggression according to him. And he, and he sees globalization as a Western, European way of conquering, terrorizing the Russians first, and then impose their own capitalistic, financial, economic uh, relations on the Russian Federation. And he advocates war between the Russians and the West Europeans. Without war, Russia has no particular existence. Do you accept his thesis? <laughs> I think uh, sh uh, we should uh, take some more other type of questions and then because uh, rather than concentrating on this, uh, whether Russia is Europe or not. But I, I, as I can see that uh, Alexei rightly said that uh, Russian wanted to be Europeans and uh, because the policies and the, this culture and other things, uh, but then uh, probably didn't work. And it's now the can Russia cancellation that the way is going on uh, in Europe, uh, even canceling language, canceling uh, cultural activists, canceling the sports people from the events. So that's probably forcing Russia to take a side with the East. Probably. And it is a, a, it's a gr growing scenario and probably in the next five, 10 years, it will be more clear that which side Russia takes and uh, how it uh, evolves. I think I, we have some uh, very interesting questions uh, from the other participants, especially from um, our online participants. One question is, um, I'm just uh, reading it out. A considerable amount of Russian naval assets are currently committed to the conflict in Ukraine, leaving the Russian Navy with limited assets to use in the Indo-Pacific region. What strategies does Russia plan to implement to address this material deficit when engaging in this area? So that's one question. I just need to give another question and then probably you can answer. Uh, the other question is, uh, about the war that uh, the, the whole uh, the scenario that we are discussing here, these are all happened because of the war. If the Russia did not start the war or aggression, so no, no, no uh, problems in this world that we are now facing could be happened. So how, how you see this uh, proposition that the, the, the war needs to be blamed for all these things that we are seeing? Okay, thank you. So the first question, in fact, really is the uh, minor part of Russian Navy is involved in the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, so it's just uh, our current Black Sea fleet there. Uh, it's not very big, but uh, so the main part of our Navy now is uh, situated on the northern flank. It's so-called northern fleet there. Uh, because during the Cold War, so it was the main theater of operations, because so the main goal of the uh, our northern fleet was to cut uh, lines of supplies to the American and uh, uh, so NATO, uh, to, the, to the NATO forces that of, uh, well, would fight in Europe against the Soviet uh, offensive. So the main part of our Navy is still on the northern flank. And now I think that uh, so we will have to increase our presence in Pacific theater and maybe to uh, redistribute some of our Navy, some of our strength from the Northern Post to the Pacific Post. 
So, uh, of course, now we have a lack of resources and we have a lack of uh, so ships there. But uh, anyway, in, uh, so I think that sanctions and the, all this situation is for long. And uh, so it will not end in this year, next year, maybe so conflict will end. But anyway, the situation will go on. So with the sanctions, with the restrictions, with all these problems, with the trying to use sanctions economic as a leverage on the Russia on Russia, so on the Russian position, and so uh, for us, our turn to the east is inevitable thing. So uh, the fate will, in fact, push us to increase our presence on the Pacific Ocean. It's uh, our main goal now. Uh, so, uh, what about the second question? You know, uh, as a historian, I can say that, uh, in fact, it's a problem with the finding the, uh, so the first problem in the history. So, of course, so now we have war in Ukraine, well, conflict in U Ukrainian conflict, and uh, so because of this conflict, we have the sanctions. Okay. Uh, so, if uh, this conflict was a result of, uh, in fact, the Ukrainian uh, shelling and uh, Ukraine trying of Ukrainian trying, well, to destroy the Donbas republics, so-called people republics, well, they call the separatist republics. Well, these republics uh, were created because of the uh, conflict in the Kiev, well, um, so-called Maidan in 2014. Well, this conflict was a result of Russian pressure on the Ukrainian internal policy, according to Ukrainians. Well, this pressure was a result of NATO expansion. So we can uh, look for the first point until the, I think, the first man. So we can, of course, we look at it in Adam and Eve, but it's um, too deep for me. So I think uh, that, the, so we have to, in fact, uh, the resolution of all the situation could be ad hoc, but uh, with the looking uh, into the, well, uh, into the history, because we have to understand that there is no modern conflict, there is no any conflict without its history roots. And you cannot solve this conflict just, so let's okay, let's, so we'll make a peace, no problem, we are friends all together, so we'll, let's build a bright future. Well, and uh, so uh, I can answer that, of course, uh, so Russian, beginning of Russian military operation in Ukraine uh, was the starting point, point for this sanction. But European countries, in fact, uh, so the uh, reason for this operation was the expansion of NATO and so on, so on, so on. At the same time, European countries had uh, a choice. They could not uh, sanction Russia but uh, in fact, had not uh, press Ukraine and uh, well to oblige them to implement Minsk agreements. Well, because in fact, so we have the direct situation when uh, European countries supported Ukraine. So Minsk agreements were signed well from both sides. At the same time, according to Merkel, according to the French president, according to Macron, European countries uh, secretly supported Ukraine, secretly built its army, and secretly pushed Ukraine towards the uh, uh, well, restoration of its power over the Donbass republics. Uh, so you always have choice. You uh, always, uh, so in European countries, of course, had their one. So they could uh, try to uh, stop Russia, to punish Russia, to uh, go to conflict with Russia, or to build peaceful relations with Russia. They made their choice, so now what we see now is a result of this choice. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ishtiak Sarutsho from BB Department. So I have a question for Dr. Alexei and the Russian delegate that uh, as the war rages on Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine, so uh, US has put sanctions on uh, the Russian Federation, and for that reason, we have uh, we have seen that uh, we have seen that that they have a uh, um, they have been sanctioned from the Swiss Swiss banking uh, Swiss banking network. 
So what can be the monetary policy uh, for the trading partners with the Indo-Pacific region and the partners with, uh, that they will uh, do trade on? That's the question. Can you repeat the question? I want to follow. Okay. So what can be the monetary policy for the Indo-Pacific region partners so that Russia can trade with the partners? So probably he is asking about the yeah. currency swapping or so what are the alternative solutions to counter? Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's good. Yeah, you what know, you know, we have a uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Has own, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We have, in fact, our own financial instruments, and now we are trying to find the solution. So, solution is not found until now because, well, uh, so, but, uh, so I think, well, uh, there are a lot of uh, ways, well, it's to use, uh, well, uh, money. So your regimen B, well, to use uh, dirham, so on. We have uh, our special system that is similar to SWIFT to uh, provide any uh, solution for this well. For SWIFT, the main problem is not SWIFT. The main problem is American secondary sections of the using of dollars, of the United States dollars. And uh, so we are, uh, the, problem, the problem is, well, solvable, but the problem is, uh, it's not solved until now. Well, I'm I'm afraid I cannot say you more because I am part of a Russian team that trying to solve this problem. Well, it, uh, so it's not for the open open floor. I'm very awfully sorry. Okay, so we have a few more questions from the uh, Zoom. One is about uh, the question is that whether Russia was prepared for this. Um, this economic and this uh, political uh, reactions coming from the West, because um, it's said that uh, Russia probably, uh, because the West has already confiscated uh, Russian assets and uh, reserves in many parts of the world. So was Russia prepared for this kind of a thing? Was there a preparation for it? Uh, so that's uh, one question. The other is uh, regarding uh, this, uh, the media. And it has been said that the, the West, Western media, they are in far ahead of the, the Russian uh, kind of media, the kind of uh, propagations, and, and uh, they have created the narratives uh, which the Russians and the alternative uh, media could not create. So how do you see it? Yeah, was it first? I'm sorry. Uh, this, was Russia prepared for oh. the sanctions? Uh, so uh, I don't know, in fact, because I'm not an employee of our Ministry of economics, but as far as I see, we were not fully prepared, we were par partly prepared on that, but uh, we overestimated the European uh, uh, pragmatism, in fact, because uh, we were not ready uh, for Europeans uh, so lightly and so uh, so lightly uh, breaking their own rules to arrest uh, so money and so on, so on, so on, because, well, when, uh, for example, the United States invaded into Iraq, nobody arrested their, well, their money in Europe. Uh, so uh, there is a difference between so-called club of gentlemen, well, in Europe and other world. So, well, if you are Jupiter, you can do that. If you are both, well, you cannot. So it's uh, we were not prepared for this, of course. But I think that our economic block of our government uh, so now does its best because uh, Russian economy is working well now. We do not have a big inflation. We do not have any uh, unemployment in our country. So and uh, the uh, current operation of the conflict in Ukraine, well, war, name it as you will, as you wish. So in fact, uh, when you live in Moscow, in any Russian city, uh, so it's very far from you. Uh, so it's not, you cannot even notice this conflict except the TV. And uh, so second question, question about uh, our media, yeah, it's our problem because, uh, so, you know, we are not English speaking country. We do not, we have, uh, so you are in Bangladesh, South Asia, well, 
the as a whole well it's a part of uh in fact english speaking world and so is a part of western narrative uh and uh we have some institutes in russia well we have some agencies we have russia today there uh we have a lot of english speaking uh people but uh the problem is connectivity between the auditorium and between all these speakers because well russia today uh so we have uh a special service during the soviet union oriented on the uh so called well developing countries well uh it was called innovishania so it's uh broadcasting on the foreign countries well and it's broadcasted in bengali for example in hindi in urdu and a lot of languages so but uh so after the collapse of soviet union it was stopped because uh, our politics was changed and uh, our minister of foreign affairs uh, kozarev said okay let's stop all these soviet practices let be part of revolt let be part of uh, well world economy so we have no enemies we have no well competitors in the world so let's all let's live in peace peace and prosperity for all but uh, so it uh, so it failed this politics failed and now we are trying to restore our innovation it's not innovation of course it's Russia today special uh, services for uh, foreign broadcasting and as far as i know last year so they restored uh, the division uh, oriented on the south asia indian division they do not have uh, people with local languages until now but they are trying to restore this broadcasting in english and uh, maybe they will found find uh, some members uh, some people some employees with the local languages uh, so uh, we have another main problem it's i can say you as a part of this problem when uh, indian uh, newspapers or indian uh, tv uh, shows or indian well producers well ask us about commentary on the ukrainian conflict they uh, usually ask wrong people because we are specialists on south asia not on ukraine well because they connect uh, well known people in moscow and they will known people in moscow is the people who are focused on india on bangladesh on sri lanka not on ukrainian war so we cannot comment the situation on the front because we are not military experts so uh, this problem is solvable i think and we are trying to explain our counterparts here so they have to uh, a bit redistribute their ties with moscow expert and sometimes it works thank you so that's the reality that the information war is is a bigger war sometimes than the real war so that's also is a very important part we have the question uh, from the student we'll take uh, one or two more and then we will uh, conclude please uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Alexey and his team here in North South University. My name is King Gatsring and I'm pursuing this computer science and engineering. Uh, my question is, uh, what, what is Russia's position on key issues in Indo-Pacific region, such as the territorial disputes that it's, uh, is China Sea disputes and the freedom of navigation and at the same time, the North Korean nuclear program in Indo-Pacific region. So I think maybe my colleagues answer better than me. I can because because they are, so they are officials here. I'm not official. Well, I'm an academician. I can say that uh, so we have about our position there. We are on the territorial disputes. We think that it's a, a bilateral problem. It's a problem of countries. They dispute between themselves. That's why we do not support North China, North Vietnam, for example, and they dispute around the South, well, South China Sea, and North China, on any other side there, non China, non Japan, in the well, they dispute on Senkaku Island, so Yau well. Islands, uh, where we are part of this dispute as in Kurils, we have well, our firm special position. Uh, so uh, about, uh, what was the second, I'm sorry, about free navigation passage. Well, uh, so we think that, uh, so we support the idea of uh, closed waters 
in fact, because we have, uh, uh, so, you know, we are part of all United Nations conventions, so, and we support the rules of international law of these conventions. So, uh, any ship have right, has right of free passage there. Well, uh, except it's, uh, if it's not free passage, if uh, these ships go to territorial waters, it's good uh, tradition to ask the well, 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 to ask the country that owns these waters. So for us, uh, we are as country that has and uh, so is increasing our presence and presence in the Pacific and our fleet and in the Pacific, our marine and in the Pacific, we're interested in free passage and free navigation there. But until it's not a provocation. So you know that Taiwan Strait situation when you have uh, phonops there. Uh, so it's it's clear provocation. Well, well, we'll show you that we have the right. We'll have the right to well that our ships can pass with uh, weapons. Well, and to show you that it's not your waters. That it's uh, so it's Taiwan waters, international waters, but not yours. Well, of course it will not. Uh, it's not for the peace. You know, it's why we are against all this. About uh, North Korean nuclear, so we have official documents. And it's all. So all there is our position. Well, we do not, so we are part of nuclear club. Well, we are against the proliferation of nuclear weapons there. But at the same time, we think that the sanctions against uh, North Korea well, it's, uh, well, the main, uh, so they're not, in fact, against, they cannot leverage uh, the North Korean politics. So uh, we're against unilateral sanctions, but we are for the sanctions that were approved by the Security Council. Okay. So, but of course, we understand that any launch of nuclear weapons from North Korea is, uh, well, uh, people in Vladivostok are not happy about that. They're a bit scared in every situation. I'll just add up a few things. Um, well, uh, as Alexei just told that we are um, uh, for international law in all the aspects, uh, uh, we are to settlement of all disputes on the basis of international law, first and foremost, <laughs> the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And speaking about international law, just for the sake of discussion, for the sake of uh, uh, to encourage students to think independently, uh, there is the, this um, notion of uh, rules-based order. And what I'm encouraging you here to think, what is behind these words? What kind of rules? Because you never have seen a list of what are the rules. Because when we talk about international law, it's UN conventions, right, multilateral documents that are wide and open for public uh, view, we can always understand what it's all about when we talk about international law. But when we talk about rules-based order, what is it all about? What are those rules? And uh, it's a, this is narrative has been promoted by so many um, official people, uh, by so many academics, but no one has ever been able to answer the questions. What is this rules you are talking about? That's for you to think yourself. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shahidullah, comments. Thank you very much. My name is Shahidullah. I'm a faculty at North South University. Thank you very much for a uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, sort of a deliberation. You can see there's a lot of appetite to. Uh, hear and understand the other narratives, which often we don't get exposed to. Um, I have multiple questions, but I'm not going to ask this. I'm going to ask very fundamental questions from the Bangladesh's point of view. Now, the first question is that how do you actually uh, narrate the conflict between Ukraine and Russia from your own angle? The reason I'm asking these questions is that it has a larger implications for a smaller nations of the world. I hope you understand what I'm trying to indicate at. Because that's going to set whatever international order that we are looking at in terms of whether is it, is it okay if you think that a smaller nation 
actually belongs to you, historically, geographically, and everything. And then one fine morning, you go and take it over. So that creates a fear among a large number of smaller nations. And that's why you see countries like Bangladesh are dithering as to what to do. Not because, um, and, and, the, and the whole dithering comes because we have a special relationship with Russia and with Soviet Union. I mean, just uh, you mentioned about 71, the Seventh Fleet I was surprised to see that there's a Russian submarine already in the bay. That was a big game changer in those days. And then subsequent uh, uh, veto uh, in the resolution not to have a peacekeeping force <laughs> in, uh, uh, in, in the in, in the East, East Pakistan. So how do you see this? And then have your intellectuals thought out that what kind of an implication it will have in the global borders may not be correct, may not be ideal, but borders which has been created artificially, which sometimes could be, could be vacillating. But it, it keeps a status. And if the big powers, including Russia, wants to change that, how it will have an impact on the smaller nations. So I look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Your question is very fruitful to discuss, you know, for me as a historian, especially. Uh, well, because, uh, well, we understand that the problem, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, well, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, you have all right, well, to be scared about that, about the, well, the change in the situation, so on, so on. So my uh, uh, question to you, so only big power has no right to change the borders or any power has no right to change the border? Uh, I think, yeah, if you're talking about the realistic point of view, yeah, yeah. the power structure, certainly the big powers, but that's what we want to make change. We want the smaller nations should also have a say, unlike 1945, in the new order that we are making. But uh, situations like Ukraine, Russia is creating uh, difficulties for a smaller nation to say that, you know, I have a voice also, I have a say also, the global south that's being uh, talked about. So that, you know, that gets little backseat. And that's where the dilemma is from Bangladesh. Uh, yeah, but in fact, so uh, uh, if you look on the Donbass region conflict, well, the situation was the, uh, not to, well, to change the border. Well, the first. The situation was to uh, secede uh, Donbass Republic, who didn't want to be a part of Ukraine, well, and to create new uh, entities, Lugansk Donbass uh, People Republic and Donetsk People Republic. So to create even smaller nations inside these nations. If you look at the uh, Russian borders around, well, all the situation in uh, our post-Soviet space, you will find that there were no territories that Russia included until Crimea. Well, because Abkhazia, uh, so was one part, well, South Ossetia in Georgia, well, Transistria in Moldavia, all of them are even more small powers, even more small states. They are not recognized, well, but uh, so uh, the situation was, uh, it's a situation, well, when you create a new, new bodies there, that uh, you always uh, came to uh, flip-flop the situation. Well, you can uh, side as a uh, willing of big, big power, well, to uh, divide your territory, but at the same time, you can flip-flop it and you look at it as a uh, trying of a new entities of new people to create its own, own state, own, well, own country. So we prefer to see on it as uh, from this point of view. Well, because so uh, you can associate yourself in this situation with Ukraine. Uh, and this, well, you have some separatist movement, for example, and so they can create this own state. But you can at the same time associate yourself with Donbass and Lugansk People Republics with the support of Russia. India at that time, well, uh, created the independence. So it's I uh, so because the 
as a historian, I can say that uh, so linear borders, it was Western inventions and were, they were created just in the middle of 19th century in Europe. And uh, so uh, from the beginning, the borders changed, changed a lot in Europe, in Asia. And uh, so maybe in Asia now, uh, they, uh, uh, India and China are uh, more occupied uh, well by this uh, problem than the Europe because well fight uh, over Ladakh well, to get some uh, square kilometers of inhabited territory without any economy there is a typical well uh, problem of sovereignty over the territory and uh, so please yes as and uh, yes. So I fully, you know, the historical rationale and the appetite for lands and other things. But uh, as, a, as a consequences, you will see that some of the smaller nations, especially uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific, more so in, um, in African Latin America, uh, the smaller countries are finding it very difficult to continue to keep a balance which so far being maintained. And it has, it has um, sort of a bit, the smaller countries, um, I'm using small and not small, um, continue to survive. That has become difficult. Some of the smaller countries are now pushed by other powers. This is the time you decide which one, which side you are we're going to go. And you know, possibly it would happen in 50, 100 years, but it, the whole process has been quickened. And that's making hell out of some of the smaller nations in, um, in, in Asia. So that's where the problem is that this whole conflict has created a, a situation where smaller nations with nothing to do with it, are not party, being forced into that in a different way. So that's what I'm saying uh, um, is, is becoming a difficult. I, I know we don't have an answer, but I just wanted to give you a feel as to how countries like Bangladesh are facing difficult time. Thank you. I understand here, yeah, but uh, so, uh, just one, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one word for me. Well, I don't think that uh, the Russian Ukrainian crisis will create new nations in Asia. In fact, after that, it will be something like a uh, flame that ignites a big flame in the Asia. Well, uh, uh, but uh, try to look on this conflict as the a very postponed civil war after the Soviet Union collapse, because so we had just local conflict, nothing like a great Russian civil war after the collapse of Russian Empire in uh, so 1917. But uh, so uh, we had situation where the new nations were created along the administrative borders. And these administrative borders in Soviet times, uh, so we were created just for economic reasons, not uh, without any ideas of people who live there, because so in fact, this, uh, in fact, well, on the ground, this uh, borders did not exist. And uh, so uh, it's for us, maybe, maybe it's a good thing to see it, to look at it as a, a very, very postponed civil conflict after that. Thank you. Look forward. Similar interactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alex. We tremendously lack. And we are at the end of the session. And especially, again, thank you very much for very enlightening uh, discussion, debates, and discourses uh, for some critical thinking of our students and uh, faculty members. Uh, I would again like to uh, thank all the delegations coming here and all the students and also the uh, faculty members who participated. Before I end the program formally, I just want to give an invitation for our next event. And as I was saying that uh, we are having this week on Wednesday, uh, is a, another uh, uh, policy colloquium. The title is From the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal, New Possibilities in, the Bang in Bangladesh, Japan, and India Trilateral Partnership. And this is again, we'll be focusing on Indo-Pacific because now we are having a discussion in Bangladesh and uh, Northeast India and Japan that uh, how these three countries can uh, together for some developmental projects uh, uh, getting into in place. So I would like to request you and invite you all to participate. That will be at 11 o'clock on Wednesday, uh, 17th of this month. With that note, again, thank you all and uh, for uh, joining this event. 
and we are concluding the uh, seminar with this note for the students uh, you can take your some uh, uh, light refreshment and for the guests we would like to request you to go to sipg conference room for lunch thank you mm -hmm.